So we're going to be discussing today chapter 13 of the Wilkins, which is the extra oral intra oral examination. We call it the EOIO for extra oral intra oral examination. EOIO, you'll see that abbreviation. <coughs> Excuse me, so we've got the learning objectives, um, hint, hint, because that is what you need to know for the exam when this chapter is being um, taken care of for you. Now, why are we doing an intraoral and extraoral cancer exam? At if We aren't using usually the word cancer. I call them the OCE. That's how I grew up for oral cancer exam. <coughs> Excuse me, but this is performed for early identification of abnormalities and pathologies, especially for oral cancer. Oral cancer is deadly. By the time oral cancer is found, it's usually in one of the more advanced stages. So the prognosis and the mortality is, is the prognosis is poor and the mortality is high when it comes to oral cancer. And most of it is because it's not diagnosed early enough. And we know where oral cancer, uh, the prime spots for it are. And we want to be able to teach our patients to take a look and know what's normal for their mouth as well. So that if they see anything different or um, that's concerning them, they can bring it to our attention. But the essential goal for the examination is really to detect cancer of the mouth at the earliest possible stage. And so we do a thorough examination um, to, that includes thyroid disorders, eating disorders, um, nutritional deficiencies, sexually transmitted diseases, and uh, there's just a bunch of systemic conditions as well that we can pick up in the mouth. The mouth is called the gateway of the body, and it's that for a reason. Some people even do something called tongue mapping, where they can take a look at your tongue and um, determine what deficiencies you have because you've got this on this section or that on that section. I've never had my tongue mapped before. But what are some of the components of uh, a thorough examination? The I, whole idea is it's sort of like a dance. You want to get comfortable with the routine and you are going to be doing it over and over and over again so that it, when it does become routine, you won't miss anything. But when you're first trying to learn how to do anything, it's going to be very cumbersome. So we want to go through the entire assessment with the patient. So we've done the medical history and the dental history. We already know what their alcohol, tobacco use is, some of their cultural and genetic susceptibility, possibly sun exposure and lack of sun protection, their diet, what is their snacking history, uh, their social history, do they have a history of human papilloma virus or are they at risk for it? All of this stuff is considered uh, part of our assessment and we have to become comfortable talking with our patients about all of this and um, be non-judgmental with the information that we're getting. So face masks with this COVID have helped a lot. They, you, they can still see your eye roll though. So uh, you need to be careful of that. And I have what my students call and my daughter calls RBF for resting B face. Uh, I look like I'm mad at everybody all the time. Well, you know, you get to be in my age group, your face is gonna fall off too. So this is going to be routine. We're going to tell our patients uh, what, the, uh, what we're doing and we're going to tell them why in simple terms without, um, without belittling or demeaning what we're doing. Um, so, you know, oh, I'm just going to check for lumps and bumps. That is not telling the patient the importance of what we're doing or giving credit to what the education and the license is that you are holding when you graduate 
So let's take a look at the different types of examinations. And those of you that have worked in medical or dental know that there's a separate code for all of these for insurance purposes. Um, but a complete examination is uh, really includes a thorough summary of all the components of the assessment. The extra and intraoral examination is part of the complete assessment and is performed on all patients at every visit. The book says at each continuing care visit, but guess what? When you have a patient in the morning and you have that same patient in the afternoon, you are doing an EOIO, but you're not doing it from scratch. You're just looking to see if there's any changes from the morning. So you've got your complete exam, then you have your screening exam, and screening is exactly what it implies, a brief preliminary examination that's usually for a particular purpose, such as, you know, they're, they're coming in for pain, and so that's what you're zeroing in on, or for initial patient assessment, so you can triage to determine the priority of treatment, you know, where where do they need to go first? Do they need a full mouth series of x-rays? Do they need just a periapical and uh, something else done? So that's the screening. Um, and then there's the limited exam and that's a brief exam made for an emergency situation. So hygienists will be seeing patients also in an emergency situation because that's the only room that was available to bring the patient in. So it's not uncommon for you um, as a hygienist to have somebody there out, on an emergency. So you're doing the preliminary assessment as well as the limited examination. You're getting all the facts together and the diagnostics together for the doctor to be able to make a proper diagnosis. And then you've got your follow-up. Uh, examination and that's a brief follow-up exam to check the healing following treatment. So we have what we call a periodontal um, re-evaluation. You've treated your patient, you've gotten them in for their dozen appointments or six appointments, whatever it is, and instead of sending them off for three months, have a nice life, you bring them back in six to eight weeks. So you can do another assessment, it's another periodontal assessment, to see how their gum tissues are responding to um, the treatment, are they healing? Are there still areas of inflammation or infection? Is a three month recare appropriate or do you need to um, alter that? And that's what the perio reeval is. And then you've got continuing care or reevaluation. Your office will call it whatever. We are getting away from the term recall. Recall has a negative connotation to it, like your car is being recalled, piece of equipment. Okay, so it's a recare, continuing care, your periodontal maintenance therapy, uh, whatever your office calls it. Um, but that is maintenance after a specific period of time following the completion of a care plan along with the um, anticipated restore, restoration back to health. And then the maintenance examination is a complete reassessment, um, which is always going back to the dental hygiene diagnosis and then the care plan that's been derived. The maintenance examination, are you maintaining? Are you getting better? Are you getting worse? Is three months adequate for you or do you need to be coming in more frequently or can we be extending the time in between your appointments? And that's what the reevaluation is all about. So we've got various methods of examination and we're going to go over each one of these. The, and we are going to be going into this in more than one course. We're going to be doing this again in DNH 146, which is your perio next semester. So think about how easy that chapter is going to be by the time you get there. It's just a review. So we've got a visual examination and that's direct observation. And we're using visual observation that's carried out in a systematic sequence. So we're not forgetting everything, color, contour, consistency, size, those type of things. We're going over them in the same pattern with each and every person. Direct observation, then the radiographic examination where we're looking at previous radiographs or current radiographs. We're using something called transillumination 
with your mirror. And that I know is on the test, my friends, the word transillumination. And that's when a strong light is directed through the soft tissue or a tooth. And what it does is it enhances examination because you're using shadows so it can detect irregularities of the teeth and locating calculus. So you hold the mouth mirror to view from the lingual to see the translucency of those anterior teeth. So the uh, transillumination is trying to get that light to shine through the tooth onto the mirror so you can see the different parts of the teeth. So those are the different visual examinations, direct observation, radiographic, and transillumination. Then you have palpation. And palpation is an exam using the sense of touch through tissue manipulation or pressure on an area with your gloved fingers of one hand or both. So you need to know the different types of palpation. Digital palpation, so use of a single finger, one digit. So a, uh, an example of that would be having your finger on the uh, floor of your mouth, beneath the canine. You're trying to determine if there's any uh, mandibular tori present. You're feeling the bone with just one finger. Digital, then there's bi-digital, which is the use of a finger and thumb of the same hand. So think about if you wanted to feel the lips, okay? You'd need, uh, you'd need both fingers. Then there's bi-manual, which is using the finger or fingers and thumb of each hand applied simultaneously in coordination. So that's bi-manual. And then you've got bilateral. Two hands are used at the same time to examine different structures on the opposite sides of the body. So if you have your hands in front of your ears, you've got one hand in front of one ear and another hand in front of the other ear, ask the patient to open and close. You're feeling for that temporomandibular joint movement, and that is bilateral. Then you've got your instrumentation method of examination. And that's just as it says, it's using your instruments, okay? It's usually your periodontal probe and your explorer. Your assessment instruments in your kit are color-coded with a yellow band. So your mirror, your probes, your explorers, and I think your pickups or your cotton forceps have yellow. I'm sorry, pink, they're pink on them. Assessment instruments, which you'll be learning soon. Then there's percussion, and that's the act of tapping on a tooth or a surface with the fingers or an instrument. So you're going tap, tap, tap. Does that hurt? Tap, tap, tap. Or you're going tap, tap, tap. Bum, bum, bum. Tap, tap, tap. Trying to listen for different sounds. And the information can determine health by the response of the patient or by the sound. And again, you are going to be doing this on everybody, so you'll know what the normal is and normal variation. So those were the different types of um, visual and then palpation. Then we talked instrumentation, percussion, and now the electrical test. This isn't something that I have done very often, but there's something called an electric pulp tester that can be used to detect the presence or absence of a vital pulp tissue. And if you remember that pulp tissue is where that lymph tissue is, the nerve of the tooth, and the blood all goes through the center of the tooth. So they, uh, the patient's holding something metal and then there's another wand that goes inside the patient's mouth with a conductor like toothpaste or something and there's a dial and you just kind of bring that dial up and the patient will tell you when they feel a tingling. It's not a sharp electrical shock, it is a tingling. And then you record the numbers accordingly. Uh, most of the offices that I've been in, the doctor likes doing this because it was something different for them to do. And finally, we have oscillation. Oscillation is the use of sound. What have you learned so far that uses sound? It's, it's your blood pressure, okay? When, 
hopefully you'll get your blood pressure cuff soon so you can really practice. But the sound of clicking of the temporomandibular joint, for example, when you open and close, that's oscillation. Sometimes you don't need a stethoscope. You're just, you can hear the crunch or the click or the crepitus. So this is showing you palpation of the lip. What type of palpation is this? Is it digital, bi-digital, manual, bimanual, bilateral? It's bi-digital. And those of you that have your book open can see that, okay? So that's what you're doing using your forefinger and your thumb for palpation of the lip. It's bi-digital. Then you've got your bimanual, using two hands for the buccal mucosa and the floor of the mouth. Bimanual, checking for the temporomandibular joint. So we're looking and then we're feeling. Looking first and then we're feeling. And one of the things we do for an oral examination, intraoral, before we do anything inside the mouth, is we look. We look outside the mouth also before we touch something because we don't want to be putting our fingers on something that's oozing or could hurt the patient. We used to do this without gloves on too. So we really looked, you know, you're pulling the ear back. You're, you're looking before you touch. But a specific objective for the patient examination as part of the complete assessment is really the recognition of deviations from normal that may be signs or symptoms of disease. A lot of times the patient's not even aware of things, so it, they're relying on us to see these deviations from normal. General signs and symptoms may occur in various disease conditions, so if they've got a fever, um, then we know that there's something going on uh, with infection. So a pathognomonic sign or symptom is unique to a particular disease and may be used to help distinguish that condition from one disease or the other. Now with COVID, if you've got your dry cough, you know, some of these signs and symptoms um, transcend many different other ailments. So uh, it's, it's hard to pinpoint things. So what's the difference between a sign and a symptom? A sign is any abnormality identified by the healthcare professional, which is you, while examining the patient. A sign is an objective symptom. It's an objective symptom. So examples of signs, observable changes in color, shape, consistency, abnormal findings re, uh, revealed in the use of a periodontal probe or an explorer or the radiographs or other instruments. It's an observable change by the healthcare professional. A symptom is any departure from normal that may be indicative of disease. So a symptom can be subjective. So that's observed by the patient. I'm tender or pain upon opening. This tooth hurts when, uh, when I have something cold or hot to it. That is a symptom versus the sign is observable is gingival recession on that tooth is the sign. The symptom is sensitivity. Does that make sense? So what do you need to uh, get ready for your examination? The first one is your review patient's health history, as well as the dental medical record, including the risk factors, looking at radiographs, dental caries, the perio, and the oral cancer risk assessment. So it seems like everything you do in the chair has some sort of a risk assessment that can be used along with it. So this is even before the patient sits down. You're examining radiographs, 
okay, on the computer. You're um, explaining procedures to the patient that needs to be performed and the relevance of those procedures. So you're letting the patient know that you're going to be performing an extra intraoral examination to look for abnormalities that can affect your health and your overall health because we know there is an oral systemic link. Okay, things that are going on in the mouth can affect the entire body and vice versa. When I was a student, we weren't allowed to use the word cancer or looking for cancer. So a lot of us got in the habit of using lumps and bumps. Um, I never did that because I was proud of my RDH. But you want to let the patient know because also you're letting them know what you're doing, that they are getting an oral cancer exam or an intra extra oral cancer screening, however you want to put it because they don't know what you're doing. Oh, oh, is that why the doctor takes my tongue with the gauze? Yeah, we're doing a cancer screening. It's not just because we like to feel your tongue. So we're explaining everything and we're explaining it to the patient in words that they can understand. And we also need to let the patient know why we're going to be asking them to do certain things. Like if they're wearing a hijab or a scarf or other neck covering uh, for whatever purposes, religious, cultural, whatever, we need to be sensitive with our communication skills to be able to explain to them why we would like them to uh, loosen it, take it off, let me look behind the ears at the base of your neck. Once you do that, we can, um, you can put your wrap back on, okay? It's not that we want them sitting exposed um, for the entire appointment, but it's just so we can do a thorough exam. And in all of my years, I've only had one patient refuse to do that for me, just one. So most patients are very accommodating and understanding if you let them know what you're doing and why. So you need to know a little bit about the anatomical landmarks of the oral cavity. And we got into this a little bit last week in oral anatomy. So you need to be familiar with these structures. What is oral mucosa? And oral mucosa is divided into that masticatory mucosa as well as the lining mucosa and then the specialized mucosa. Does that sound familiar? So the masticatory covers the gingiva and the hard palate uh, in the areas mostly used during the chewing of food. Except for the free margin of the gingiva, the masticatory mucosa is firmly attached to underlying tissues. It is keratinized. Then you've got your lining mucosa, which covers the inner surfaces of the lips and the cheek and the floor of the mouth and the underside of the tongue and the soft palate, as well as the buccal mucosa. These tissues are not firmly attached to underlying tissues and the epithelium covering is not keratinized. And then you've got oops, your specialized mucosa. Let me do this here. Your specialized mucosa, and that is talking about the tongue. Covers the dorsum or the upper surface of the tongue, and it's composed of various papillas. Some contain taste buds, but there are four types of papilla that you will need to identify when you are doing your oral cancer exam or your EOIO. You've got your filiform, fungiform, circumvallate, or valate and foliate. So the filiform are the thread-like keratinized elevations that cover the dorsal of the tongue and they're the most numerous. Okay, it gives the tongue the velvety uh, texture. Then the fungiform are mushroom-shaped papilla and they're kind of interspread among the filiform. They're usually a little bit redder than the filiform papilla and they contain a lot of taste buds. Your circumvallate are the ones in the back that form a V. They uh, have taste buds that line those walls as well. And then the foliate are the vertical grooves on the lateral posterior sides of the tongue. They also contain taste buds. So, excuse me, we were talking about this uh, last week 
your soft palate and your uvula. These are your pillars. You've got your anterior and your posterior pillar. Do you remember the names of them? Your palatine tonsils lie between Very, them. Go ahead. The platioglossal and the platypharyngeal. Yeah. Glossal tongue and pharyngeal, the back of the throat. And I have the hiccups. I apologize. So you will be identifying all of these inside your mouth, inside your patient's mouth, on the radiographs that you take with Mrs. Heberly and the labs. You'll be identifying them radiographically. So what's the sequence of the events? We are going to be showing you in clinic our way of doing an EOIO, extraoral first, then change of gloves, intraoral afterwards. And we're going to show you um, how we do it. Now, I learned to start in the back of the neck, the occipital, then go behind the ear and then in front of the ear and um, go that way. Other faculty are going to teach you to start in front of the ear and then go to the back of the neck and it's all good. You're going to come up with your own routine. So uh, as long as you do everything, it doesn't matter what order you do it in because this will become a matter of routine, hopefully, before too long. Because you're gonna be doing it on each and every person, no matter who's in the chair, each and every time. So, um, you want to conduct an examination with a routine order so you're not going to miss anything. And uh, the recommended sequence for an exam is if you look on uh, box 12-1, that gives you a sequence. The sequence can, uh, it was adapted by detecting oral cancer that was from the NIH and the National Cancer Institute, but there's also other types of, of sequences that you can use. So the whole idea is that you don't skip anything and you are, um, you're doing the same thing with everybody every time. So what is the sequence of the examination? Overall appraisal of the patient. You're bringing that patient back from the reception room. That's when your examination begins. Are they uh, doing the old man shuffle? Do they have need assistance? Are they, um, you know, are they hunched over? Do they look like they have energy? Are they upright? Uh, those are the things that you're looking for. Then you're looking at the face then zeroing in on the skin, the eyes, the lymph nodes, the glands, the temporomandibular joint, okay? So all of those, and then you go from the lips, the breath odor, or that breath odor is sometimes listed last, the labial and buccal mucosa, the tongue, the floor of the mouth, saliva, the consistency of the saliva, the hard palate, the soft palate, the uvula, the tonsillar region. You're looking and palpating all of that. When I was in school, we had to palpate the soft tissue. We had to palpate behind the uvula. We had to take our mirror to look behind the uvula. That was not pleasant. So we're not making you do that anymore. They're just saying, ah. Now this is a really good picture of the ventral surface of the tongue. The dorsum is the top of it. The ventral is the bottom of it. So we've got the lingual frenum here. Not only are we looking at the lingual frenum, but is it tight? Are they tongue-tied? On the side of that frenum, you've got two little balls here, which is your sublingual caruncle. You've got your submandibular fold here, or your plica sublingualis. Then you've got these little thread-like things, skin tags coming off here, and that's called your plica fimbriata. 
You've got lingual glands, which you can't see. You've got your retromolar pad, retro behind your molar. Up here is the maxillary tuberosity. The retromylohyoid curtain, I'm not going to make you identify that. But then you've got this pterygomandibular raffe, this band of tissue here. And you're going to be looking at that when you are doing uh, local anesthesia. So all of these landmarks are going to come back and haunt you. But the ventral surface of the tongue, and this is what a number of students will print off. I have this under clinic help in, um, in Canvas, these are the lymph nodes that you are palpating. You need to know the name and the location of these lymph nodes. So when you're doing your skill evaluation for extra oral, I'm starting here. You may start here, it's okay. I'm saying I'm palpating the occipital, the postauricular, the preauricular, and then I come down this here. So I'm doing the submandibular and the submental. Then I do the sternocleidomastoid muscle, the cervical chain. So that's my routine. Your routine might be a little different, but you're calling them out. So this is a good sheet to have. I think I've got a color one in Canvas. But that's all part of the extra oral. Do we need to memorize? So we, yes, you need to memorize this. Not for the test on Tuesday or whatever, okay? But if you're familiar with these on Monday when we go over the EOIO, uh, they will at least not be so new to you. So the extra oral examination, as we said, you're looking at the patient before you even bring them back. They're seated in the reception area. You're noting their physical characteristics and any abnormalities. You're looking at their head, their face, their eyes, their neck. You're evaluating their skin, that type of thing. You're requesting the patient to remove any prosthetic devices they may have before you per, uh, perform the intraoral exam. If they're wearing a removable partial, for example, you want that out or a full denture. And you explain to the patient how this is going to let you see better what's underneath everything. You palpate after you look, you look first, then you palpate. You're gonna be palpating the salivary glands and the lymph nodes. And we looked at where those major lymph nodes were in the head and neck area. Palpation is a significant component of the EOIO. We're using our sense of palpation and our sense of feel. Is something hard? Is it soft? Is it squishy? Is it movable? Because we can't see it, we can only feel it. Is there any pain or discomfort upon palpation or when the patient swallows? Does the patient have any difficulty swallowing in the absence of pain? Are there any recent noticeable lumps that the patient may have experienced? So you're asking the patient, do they have a persistent earache or hoarseness of their voice? You're observing the mandibular movement and you're palpating that temporomandibular joint. So you've got your hand in front of their ears, asking them to open and close a couple of times. You're checking for um, arthritis and any deviation from normal with that joint. So we went over that. Okay, so we, uh, the extra oral usually ends in the patient swallowing and we're checking their thyroid gland, which is at the base of the neck, okay, below the Adam's apple, if you know where the Adam's apple is. Then we can go inside the mouth and uh, we take our gloves off, we sanitize our hands, and then we put new gloves on and we're ready to start observing other things. So we're making a preliminary examination of the lips and the intraoral mucosa. You're always, always using a mouth mirror first or a tongue depressor before you go sticking your hands in. You're doing an overall preliminary examination. It only takes 15 seconds, but you're looking. You don't want to be sticking your fingers in some big old ulcer. You're viewing and palpating. You're viewing something first and palpating it second. So the lips the labial mucosa, 
which are the lips, the buccal mucosa, and the mucobuccal fold. You're examining the tongue, you're palpating the tongue, including the dorsum and ventral surfaces, the lateral borders, and the base of the tongue. You're retracting to observe the posterior third. You're having the patient, okay? Also say ah to observe their throat area. So you've got the tongue in their hand, in your hand, with the gauze. Got to have a two by two or a gauze there, otherwise it's going to slip out and you're actually taking the tongue and moving it to one side and pinching it to palpate by digitally and then moving it to the other and palpating that side. You're feeling for scar tissue and any lumps. You're observing the mucosa on the floor of the mouth. You're palpating the floor of the mouth by manually. You're examining the hard and soft palates the tonsillar areas, as well as the pharynx. And you're using the mirror to observe that oropharynx, nasopharynx, and larynx area. So you're pressing on the tongue, you're having them say, ah. And then you're also noting the amount and consistency of saliva. Is there evidence of dry mouth or xerostomia? And again, if you can have your clinic help sheets or your cheat sheets available to guide you in the terminology, you don't have to come up with these terms yourself. You can just pick and choose according to what uh, is pertinent to your patient. And of course, you are documenting the findings. So um, you have a computer program. Our program that we use is Dentrix. There's a number of them out on the market for dental offices. And we have templates that you will follow. So you'll bring up the computer program for your oral inspection, your EOIO, and you'll go through all of this and make your notes on the template. So as you're going through, you can't forget anything because it wants you to type something. Even if it's normal, you're, you're picking normal. But proper diagnosis uh, or documentation is really important. So you want to question the patient to provide uh, them or give you the necessary information in the management of any lesion you might find. Uh, because alarming the patient really should be avoided. But sometimes they'll say, oh, yeah, it's been there forever. Uh, you know, Dr. Jones has been watching it. So judgments needed when selecting the appropriate time to obtain the history of a lesion. I was a new graduate. I had something that was at the base of the, uh, the throat and I measured it and I did all sorts of stuff and oh my God, oh my God, I found my first cancer. I took the doctor out of the room before he came in to, the, to do the, uh, the exam and he took a Q-tip and boop, there it was. It was a piece of dinner. I still remember because it was a nighttime patient. And uh, so... Anyway, you learn as you go along is the moral of that story. So now, the first thing I do is see if it wipes off. So you want to um, advise the patient, we're noticing this. We don't know how long it's been there. Have you noticed it before? If known, uh, you're marking all that down with what the patient says. Patient states, was biopsied 12 years ago, uh, came back negative and no changes. Now, whatever the history is of that particular lesion. So you're trying to get a background of a lesion that you might find. Uh, what's the location and the extent, okay? When was a lesion first seen? Are you the first one seeing it? We don't know without asking the patient. Its location is noted in relation to adjacent structures. So it's not just a lesion on the buccal mucosa of the right side. It's a petechiae on the right buccal mucosa adjacent to the distobuccal cusp of tooth number three. So can you see the difference in using proper terminology to determine where the location is? You know exactly where to look the next time the patient comes in. You want to describe it in relation to adjacent structures. So you're documenting, documenting a complete description of each finding, including the location, the extent, the size, the color, the surface texture, any configurations, the consistency, the morphology, as well as the history. So there's a lot to document. 
some oral cancer screening sheets will have a picture of a mouth and you can uh, then draw something directly on that buccal mucosa on the distal buccal of number three where that lesion specifically is. But you do need to know um, terms like localized and generalized. Localized is limited to one small focal area. Generalized, does it involve a larger area? Is it a single lesion? Are there multiple lesions clustered together? Are they separate? Are they, or are they running together? Are they coalescing? Are they so close together that the margins merge? Coalescing. What are the physical characteristics, the size and the shape? So that's where your periodontal probe comes in because it's um, marked off in millimeters. You're measuring it. Is it elevated? Is it flat? What is the color? Red, white, pink, multi. Is it yellowish, brown, blackish brown? What is that surface texture? Is it smooth? Is it irregular? So there are a lot of terms here that you do need to be aware of. We want you to use these terms when you're finding things inside of your mouth or your partner's mouth. So again, it's good to have a cheat sheet available and there's one that's on Canvas under clinic help that you can print and put into some sort of a binder that has these words in it. But you do need to know the difference between a vesicle, a pustule, and a bulla. These are usually sizes of blister form lesions. Okay, they look like a little blister. There's fluid filled. Then you have non-blister form lesions. They're, they're skin colored, papule, nodule, tumor, or plaque. All of these, again, are descriptions. And I'm not going to belabor these, but know what the difference is. I like nodule. It just sounds, I like the word nodule. It's hard, okay? Tumor, I don't like using very often personally because it's always associated with cancer and it, isn't. It's just the type of growth that it is. So non-blister forms are solid and they don't contain fluid versus the blister form contains fluid. So know what the sizes are. These are also board questions when you graduate and you're trying to get out of here and get your license. You need to know these terms. Then you have depressed lesions. Those were the elevated lesions. You've got depressed lesions. You have an ulcer or an erosion. And an ulcer is um, what most of these lesions are gonna be and they represent a loss of continuity of the epithelium. So the center of this lesion is often gray to yellow, surrounded by a red border. Think about um, a canker sore. Okay, the ulcer may be a result of a rupture of an elevated lesion. So your vesicle or pustule or bulla, it could be a popped something, okay, to become then a depressed lesion. Then there's erosion, which is shallow depressed lesion that doesn't extend through uh, out the whole epithelium to the underlying tissue. So erosion could just be a little scratch on the gum tissue. More flat lesions, we have our macules. Macules are um, circumscribed, okay, so they're circular. They're not elevated above the surrounding skin or mucosa. They may be identified by its color, which contrasts with the surrounding tissue. So guess what a macule is? If you have freckles or you have flat moles on your face, we call them scattered macules. Nothing more, okay? But there's a word for it. It's not a freckle. It's a macule. Other descriptive terms. Crust. The outer layer or covering is scab-like. Erythema red. 
exophytic, exophytic, excuse me, that's a growing outward, indurated, hardened, papillary, resembling a soft nipple-shaped projection, petechiae, that's the one you're going to be using a lot, petechiae, P-E-T-E-C-H-I-A-E, -E. it's got every vowel, seems like. Those are those minute hemorrhagic spots of pinhead or pinpoint size, that tiny little pinhead on the buccal mucosa can be a petechiae or on your lip. Pseudo membrane, a loose membranous layer of exudate that contains organisms that precipitated uh, fibrin and it's necrotic, it's usually gray. There's a polyp, which is any mass or tissue that projects outward and upward. Punctate, marked with points or dots differentiated from the surrounding surface by color. That torus, we've seen a torus, okay? That's that bony outgrowth. And verrucus, okay? Have you switched slides to the next one yet? Because it's not showing up on our oh, Oh, there we go. Okay. Okay, verrugas. Okay, verrugas. That is rough and wart-like. So think about the human papilloma virus. It's very warty-like. I apologize. Thank you. No worries. Thank you. So these are the words that you might be seeing again. These are the words I want you to have chair side. So you can use them. Oral cancer likes certain areas of the mouth, lateral borders of the tongue, the floor of the mouth, the back of the throat, I mean, we uh, in, in the vestibule. So these are the areas that we check. This is the more common sites of oral cancer. But uh, we are checking the oral cavity, the pharynx, the larynx, the uh, around the nasal sinuses, the nasal cavity. We're checking everything. So cancers of the head and neck really begin in the squamous cells that line moist mucosal surfaces of the mouth, nose, and throat. So if you've got lining mucosa, you are a candidate for cancer. Salivary glands contain different types of cells that can also become cancerous. But because early lesions are pretty much symptomless, uh, they go unnoted uh, and unreported by the patient. So it's really up to you, the dental hygienist, to do a thorough screening on each and every patient. The dentist knows you are educated to, to do this, so the dentist delegates this to you most of the time. Now, some dentists like doing their own cancer exam. I will go ahead and do it first anyway, just to point out something, because the dentists don't do a very thorough job oftentimes for oral cancer exams. And uh, two eyes are oftentimes better than one. So if both of us are checking, okay, it just um, helps us check each other because we're working as a team. So again, the oral examination is going to be a routine for you. You're going to learn the dance as you want it to occur, even though there are some basic fundamentals. But what are some of the signs of early cancer? We're looking at the location. Where is it? Is it on the buccal mucosa? Is it on the floor of the mouth? Where is it? Is it in the floor of the mouth is much more of that prime cancer area than, say, the cheek. Does that mean that the cheek is an oral cancer? Not at all. But you're looking at risk factors. The human papilloma virus, uh, what is the age of the patient, the skin exposure of the lips. Um, increasing incidence of oral cancers are being found in younger adults. So, uh, especially with HPV. So it's not just our older generation that we need to be aware of. So we're doing some sort of a cancer screening, even on the three and four year olds that are coming in the chair. We're asking them to open up. We're asking them to say, ah, uh, we're doing what we can with them just to see what their normal structures are. So what are the more common sites for oral cancer? They're the lateral borders of the tongue, the floor of the mouth, the lips, 
and the soft palate complex. All right, so those are the prime areas for oral cancer. Lateral borders of the tongue, floor of the mouth, the lips, and the soft palate. What's the appearance of early cancer? It could resemble a variety of oral lesions, but all types need to be examined with suspicion. So you're not just going, oh, canker sore. You're documenting it, you're describing it, you're documenting it, and then your dental hygiene diagnosis is your, uh, you know, it, it appears, it appears to be, you know, or looks like an aphthous ulcer. Then we've got a picture of what you've described. But you can have white areas, red areas, okay? There could be plaques on them as well. So white areas can vary from filmy, barely visible change in the mucosa to thick, heavy, uh, heaped up areas of the mouth. Fissures, ulcers, areas of hardening, induration of the white area are most indicative of malignancy. They're hardening. Leukoplakia, leuko means white, okay? Plakia, patch, there's a white patch or plaque that can't be scraped off, can be characterized by other diseases as well, but we wanna make note of it. Lesions that appear red, they can be velvety in consistency and may also coincide with small ulcers. Lesions can, uh, um, there could be erythroplakia, which is a rare oral precancerous lesion that can't be characterized if any other disease. So we're getting into the rabbit hole here where I'm not expecting you to know all of this because you're going to have an entire semester on oral cancer, head and neck cancer pathology. But you want to be able to look for white areas, red areas, ulcers, masses, Look at the difference in pigmentation to be able to describe them. You're not diagnosing, you're just describing. So what are some of the clinical recommendations for evaluating oral lesions? You bring this up to the doctor, right? Then they decide whether or not they need to be referred or do they come back in uh, two weeks? Has this ever happened to you before? So you update the history and the intra-extra oral examination for your patients. And this says adult patients, we're, we're doing it on all patients. And you follow the innocuous lesions, okay? So you're marking down these little areas of um, changes in, in normal biopsy for suspicious lesions in adults patients you don't make the determination for that the doctor makes the determination for that sometimes they'll say let's go ahead and biopsy now they'll either do it in office they'll send to an oral surgeon you'll do different types of biopsies in um in private practice uh, then you will say if you're uh if you're in a general office or an oral surgery office or a perio op office so one of the first things you do is a biopsy, okay? So that is uh, the removal and microscopic examination of tissue for the diagnosis of what type of cells there are. The problem with uh, the biopsy is that the person doing the biopsy needs to remove enough of the lateral border so the um, pathologist can see well beyond the border. And a lot of times uh, we try and be so uh, conservative with whacking off tissue that we, the doctor oftentimes doesn't take enough tissue. So that's one of the drawbacks of the biopsy. Uh, and then we wait for the pathology report. And with that, they give you the uh, diagnosis on what kind of cells there are. And hopefully it's nothing. And aren't you glad, Mr. Jones, that this turned out to be just a variant of normal and it's not cancer? Aren't you happy that we whacked off this piece of tongue and you had to spend $500 for us to find out it's normal? Because they're not going to be happy but it's the only way to know. So the biopsy, okay? Then there is also these uh, cytological smears. There's a brush biopsy, which isn't being used that often anymore. It looks like a, um, a, a wheel brush and you, you scrape off 
um, cells from that lesion and you, you scrape and scrape and scrape until you get blood to make sure you're going down deep enough. And um, then you send that off. So again, it all comes down to documentation, recommendations for frequency of the exam. Some patients you're going to want to see more frequently for other reasons than oral hygiene. Even your patients that have full dentures, not one tooth in their mouth, we still want to see them every six months, every eight months, once a year, depending, to make sure that the fit of the denture is still going okay and to make sure that there aren't un any underlying concerns below that denture. And we're documenting it, okay? So we're telling the patient that we're doing a, um, an intra-extra oral I use the word cancer, cancer exam on everybody. We're checking to make sure that everything's normal and what it looks like for you. And uh, we'll be doing this on everybody. You're not being chosen, as well as we'll do it every time you're here, just like with their blood pressure. Are there any questions? Having no questions, let's see what time it is. Okay, we're gonna take a break. I have, um, let's come back in four minutes. And what I'll do is I'll go over the, um, I'll try and find the modules and we'll go over to see what we missed in the modules. So I'm stopping the share for now. <laughs>